The following video has been sponsored in part by the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Strutner with ASAP of Anderson County and on behalf of the Prevention Alliance of Tennessee Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you to Advocacy 201. To begin, I want to draw your attention to the handout in your packet, Advocacy versus Lobbying Review, and this was provided by the Department of Substance Abuse Services for us to uh, provide a resource to remind us of the difference between advocacy and lobbying. And if you recall, to Advocacy 101, we went into detail about the differences of advocacy and lobbying, and of course lobbying can be separated into two distinct categories, direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying. This review is uh, available for you, but also important resource to share with your coalition members as well. So to review, lobbying uh, is when uh, you either directly or grassroots method um, try to affect legislation. No one may engage in lobbying with federal money, period. Direct lobbying is attempting to influence any legislation through communication with any member or employee of a legislative body or government official who may participate in the formulation of legislation, but only if the principal purpose is to influence legislation. Two required elements of lobbying, and this is what I want your takeaway with respect to lobbying to be, is it must refer to a specific piece of legislation and it must reflect the view on that legislation. Grassroots lobbying is an intent, an, any attempt to influence legislation through uh, the opinion of the general public or segment thereof. With respect to us and our positions, this would be when we reach out to our coalition members and encourage them to engage in advocacy. We have to be careful to make sure that we are uh, either not mentioning any bill numbers or we're not asking them or telling them what their view would be. So there are three elements required to constitute as grassroots lobbying. Number one, it must refer to specific legislation. Number two, it must reflect a view on that legislation. And finally, number three, it must encourage the recipient to act with respect to that leg legislation. We call that a call to action. You probably get calls to action from CADCA pretty frequently in your inbox. Um, that would be grassroots lobbying. And the way that CADCA, CADCA is a nonprofit, but the way that CADCA engages in lobbying is they have a paid lobbyist. So they have money that is not federal fund that they get from our memberships or from donations or from fee-for-service activities that they do that they are able to then use that money that are unencumbered funds to engage in lobbying. In order to do so, there are specific requirements that you have to follow as an organization uh, to make sure that you're reporting things correctly. So if you do engage in any form of lobbying, you must uh, not use federal funds and you must report that uh, with the required uh, elements to the IRS. So advocacy. Now we're talking about the fun part. This is what we get to do. So advocacy uh, allows us to talk about um, legislation and a view to the public as long as we're not giving a call to action. So we can talk about it, we can talk about the pros, the cons, we can talk about what the change would do in our community, but we can't issue a call to action. We can send a publication that discusses the importance of a policy. Uh, we can schedule a call to action as long as a specific bill number is not mentioned. You can also discuss with your senator or representative a specific piece of legislation as long as you do not advocate a specific view. It's important to take time to discuss the issues. And when we think about 
working with people who are in an elected position, they have busy schedules. And if you've never been on the Hill in Nashville, the day is very well organized. It's, I mean, they just have mere moments to go from one place to the next. Um, it, it's really um, a well-oiled machine if you look from a logistics standpoint. And so what I'm trying to say is their schedules are busy and they're booked. So we really need to make sure that we plan in advance so that we can reserve some of their time, um, that we either call them or email their assistant. And it's important that we get to know our elected officials because I need to know if I call Representative John Reagan and he doesn't call me back and he doesn't email me back, I say, oh yeah, that's because I need to contact Tyler, his assistant. Because when I email Tyler, I have an email back in five minutes. And that he's the gatekeeper for Representative Reagan. And I know that. So I know to go to directly to Tyler anytime I need something from Representative Reagan. Now, I know that my senator, Senator McNally, hardly ever checks his email. So if I need something from him, it's either going to bounce back if I send him an email or not get a response. So I've got to pick up the phone. So the first step is getting to know your local elected officials because it's imperative that you know how the best way to contact them is going to be. And then also make sure you are enough aware of their schedule to know whether you need to meet them in their Nashville office or in their home office. Make sure, please, to utilize the PAT white papers. They were created for us to have a collective voice, and the only way they're going to work is if we all use them. So please do share the white papers. Even if it's not an important issue to your coalition, if you can simply share the white paper with your elected official, it can help the organization uh, move forward. Again, when we're using the PAT white papers, we want to make sure that we're utilizing the main points. It's really easy for us to get off on a tangential story, but let's make sure that we stick to the main points. Make sure that they get the important nuggets that we need them to get, and if they want to have a more in-depth conversation, then you'll have time to do that. When you set up a meeting with your elected official, there are going to be some things that you want to make sure that you take with you. One of those things would be a coalition one-pager. Hopefully, most coalitions have some sort of informational document that share information about the coalition, its members, and its activity. And this is important for our elected officials, especially those in Nashville, because they need to know what impact you have in your community. So it's important not only to identify the who and the what, but also what are your outcomes. Make sure, A, that you're tracking them, and B, that you include those in your one pager so your elected official and any other stakeholder who sees your document sees the good that your coalition does in your community. And then finally, of course, please make sure to take the white papers with you as well. After you've had a meeting with your elected official, it's really important to follow up with them. So you may need to follow up with them because they might have had a, a question that you couldn't answer. You might need to follow up with a, an answer to that question. You might need to follow up just to say thank you or follow up to reinforce your, your message that you gave to them. And when speaking to numerous elected officials, their preferred, their overwhelming preferred method of contact is a handwritten note. And I'm with you, okay? That takes a little bit of time. But even if it's just a couple sentences, it will be more meaningful and have more impact than an email or a form letter that you could send. Um, in fact, Senator McNally has told me on numerous occasions that he looks through his handwritten notes first, that they're on the top of his stack. His assistant, Debbie, knows that form letter or emails go on the bottom, form letters go on top, handwritten notes go on the very top, and that's what he reads when he comes into his office. So making sure that we take those steps to take the extra time to express our appreciation for their time in allowing us to come to their office in ensuring that we reinforce whatever message we took to them um, is, is truly critical. I was on a panel in Clinton a few weeks ago, actually I guess it was closer to a month ago, and it was our 
chamber's uh, legislative agenda. And so there were several senators and representatives in the room as well as some of our U.S. congressional affiliates. And I got a thank you note for being on the panel from Representative Kelly Kiesling, who doesn't even represent my district. But I thought that was so remarkable that he had taken time out of his day to send me a thank you note for sharing information with him that it really, sometimes even I need a reminder of how important those handwritten notes are and they really do make quite a difference. So the handwritten note is, is really key. In addition, especially when I go to the CADCA forum in Washington, D.C., writing handwritten thank you notes to all the assistants that made your visit possible can go a long way. Um, one of the most effective things, many of you will remember Michael Foster that worked with ASAP for several years. Michael was with me uh, and Stacy was there as well at Senator McNally's office one day and he was detained uh, with some folks which was okay. We were waiting patiently and we were just shooting the breeze with his assistant Debbie at that time. And Debbie does a lot of work. In fact, all the assistants in Nashville do a tremendous amount of work. And Michael was joking around with her and said, you know, Debbie, you really need a raise. I'm going to tell the senator when we get in there that he needs to give you a raise. And she still talks about that. That's been over a year ago, yet she still talks about that. And every time I see her, she knows me and knows who, I'm, who I am and where I'm from because of our conversation that had nothing to do with any matter that was relevant to the Prevention Alliance of Tennessee. But just like your coalition, it's all about relationships and building that capacity. You might consider taking a photo with your elected official. Um, I have learned there are a few things that elected officials like more than free positive publicity. And so if you take a photograph of your group with your elected official, then it might be appropriate to share that on social media, to um, also send out a press release in your community after your visit. I think I've shared this before, and some of you probably know, a couple years ago, we kicked off a fundraiser in our community called the Red Ribbon Rivalry. Red Ribbon Rivalry is a campaign where you pay a dollar and you get a red ribbon and you write your name on it to support substance abuse prevention. And I was having coffee with uh, Representative Chuck Fleischman's uh, field representative, and she said, you know what, Rep Chuck is going to be here from Washington next week and we're going to this business opening in Lake City and then we're going to Oak Ridge and I said oh man that's really great you know what we have our red ribbon rivalry that kicks off so why don't you guys stop in to get and go market and the representative can buy a red ribbon buy a cup of coffee from a local business we'll be there we'll do a photo shoot we'll send out a press release and he did and that was in January and then in February when we went to our day on the hill in Washington, I was able to take the full color front page upper fold picture of us smiling with his red ribbon to him in Washington, D.C., and it was an election year. So don't underestimate the importance of a simple little picture that you can take when you're in Nashville. Also, uh, send a copy of the newsletter article if it appears in your local media back to your elected official just so they can see what's been happening um, in case they missed it because they're in Nashville. And then finally, ask your elected official for other ideas. If they have ideas of how they can support prevention among their constituents or uh, how you could better work with them, make sure you ask them for uh, their ideas because often that's where we get a lot of really great ones. Our 2016 policy priorities are medical marijuana, continuation of the Prescription Safety Act of 2012, also increase in access to naloxone and tobacco preemption, loosening some of the local restrictions and electronic cigarettes, decreasing access to adolescents for those. Again, the Prevention Alliance of Tennessee's white papers are available at tncoalitions.org under the What We Do link. So I'd like for you to take just a moment to perhaps with the person sitting next to you or even by yourself, think about 
how have you established or strengthened relationships with your elected officials in the past six months? What have you already done? And then secondly, how can you establish a more powerful working relationship with them? So one, what, are, what have you already done? Two, what can you do better? And then have a discussion amongst yourself and then we'll report out. Uh, I'll give you about five minutes to do this. Thank you for your discussion. I'd like to hear from some of you, um, what did you hear that struck you that people have, that coalitions have already done, have already reached out to their elected officials? Okay, in Blount County, what we have done is, um, you take care, you take, and I heard Stacy did this also, you take advantage of opportunities she was at a rotary meeting where um, the, there was the clean water. The lady was talking about clean water and brought up prescription drugs and disposal and everything. And she took that as an opportunity to remind everybody there about their 24-7 uh, drop boxes. Um, I was at a fundraiser for another organization I'm involved in, and two of our elected officials were there. Well, I wasn't on, I wasn't working at my job and they said how's your job going and I mean they asked you know what are you what are you looking at with your job and everything and so I said well because I didn't really know that I was fortunate I didn't know the papers at that time and I said well you, you know I know you one of our elected officials was involved in the medical marijuana that was held back in the summer that summit and I said that you know that is an issue for me personally and uh, so you take advantage of opportunities to establish those relationships. And one of our, our rep, I actually sat next to he and his wife at this event, so we chit chatted about a lot of things. So you just take it, you know, you establish those relationships, not necessarily on a business level. And then when you need to be there for business, when I go there in February and talk to him, it'll be a totally different. Um, atmosphere but they know they can trust me and they know my you know me personally so thank you Patty mm -hmm. one thing that you said that really stuck out to me was uh, with respect to responding to community concerns and I think that's something very relevant that we can do as coalitions if clean water in Blount County is something that's really important to Blount Countyans we have to identify how prevention plays a role in that and that's exactly what Patty did in her community. Well, what did you hear that struck you about what coalitions plan to do to better engage with their elected officials? So what we um, plan to do is get our legislators up in front of a crowd at every opportunity that we can. We know they like to do that. So when we have a medical conference, uh, we ask them to come welcome the guests and Something that's just happened is a legislator asked, we have a prevention partner of the month, and they asked if we would provide them that information each month so they can send a, a thank you letter to the prevention partner. So that going forward, kind of cozies up the relationship between us. Thank you, Bill. That's really great. I love that. Might have to copy that idea. <laughs> <laughs> for a small fee, it's available for a small fee. Anybody else hear anything that was very insightful? Um, I just want to emphasize, I can't emphasize enough about the relationship building piece. We had recently some guest speakers come to town and sort of light a fire underneath our legislators who thought substance abuse in our middle schools, you've got to be kidding. And while we didn't have any um, connection with bringing the guest speakers to town, it's opening up that door for opportunity to say, hey, yes, we're still in the community. We still address substance abuse, and here's what you can do. We're going to do those with one-on-one -on -one meetings, and I can't emphasize that enough. I know you may be a little fearful on that advocacy versus lobby piece, but build those relationships up. It's going to be so key to when you need to go and talk about what we're trying to advocate and emphasize that we need their their help and their efforts in our community so I can't emphasize that enough and research 
if you're not comfortable, I know a lot of us are not comfortable with the ask, but don't think of it that way. Think of it as you're building their relationship. You want to speak to them. Don't let senator, rep, congressman in front of their name be intimidating. Go out there and advocate, and lo not lobby, advocate uh, for your cause. So. Thank you, Tanya. Great sage <laughs> advice. Thank you all for sharing. I'd like to take a moment now to do a little bit of role playing so you can identify the difference when you see it and when you hear it. I feel like I learn a little bit better when I can see what other people are doing and know what to do or what not to do. And so I want to take an opportunity now to invite a few colleagues up to talk about uh, the difference between, thank you, the difference between advocacy and lobbying. So as we role play, I'm going to ask you to tell us whether this individual is engaging in advocacy or lobbying. Okay? So first, I will ask Stacy to please come up. Go ahead. Hi, <coughs> Senator Stratton. It's nice to see you today. Thank you for taking the time to meet with me. Good morning. I'm Thanks sure for being here. You're very busy, so I just want to get right to it and um, let you know you're probably already aware of the Tennessee Non-Smoker Prevention Act, but we've, you know, got that bill on the floor for Senate Bill 402 that will change it to where local health departments um, can decide to have their businesses, um, their department, their campuses tobacco free. And I think that's really important to our community and your constituents. So I'd really like for you to support that bill when it comes to a vote. Well, thank you. I thank you for sharing your opinions with me. Thank you for taking the time to meet okay, with me. Okay. Thanks, Stacy. What do you think? Lobbying. Yeah, yeah, very, very easy. And great job of pretend lobbying, Stacy. Thank you very much. Next, Jill is going to take a turn. Hi, Senator. Nice to see you. Good I'm morning. Jill Murphy with Hi, the Jill. Brown County Anti Drug Coalition. Just wanted to uh, take a few minutes of your time. I know you've got, you're very busy. Um, Wanted to talk to you about the prescription drug abuse um, in our county. We just wanted to educate you a little bit more on um, on the strides that we're making. You know, with the with the registration, everybody would there, we're able to track that the trend is going down, and so we appreciate all your support on on all that you've done for to help out our community on that. Well, thank you. Yeah, appreciate your time you. today. Thank you so much. What do you think? Advocacy. Yeah, and she even could have gone on to say um, a little bit more, which would have been okay. Finally, Allie. Hey everyone, thanks for coming out to the Metro Drug Coalition meeting today. Um, we have a big issue in our community. E-cigarettes are getting out of hand. Um, we are seeing with the numbers that e-cigarettes are increasing with our youth and I know I don't want my kids smoking e-cigarettes. Do you want your kids smoking e-cigarettes? Do you? Okay, so what we need to do is we need to contact each and every one of our legislators and let them know, uh, Senate Bill 113, that we want them to vote no on that particular bill so that all e-cigarettes can be banned. You guys got that? I've even taken the time to prepare the email. All you have to do is send it off and make sure you tell them <laughs> vote no on this particular bill. Great job, Brad. <laughs> Yeah, grassroots lobbying. It, Allie, great job. I don't know about you, but I was totally bought into what she was saying right there. That was, a, that was a great job. So I hope what this exercise has done for you is to help differentiate a little bit more clearly in your mind the difference between lobbying and advocacy and with respect to direct and grassroots lobbying. So um, any questions about this before we move on? Okay, so we have a couple what-if scenarios because these are commonly asked questions. So what if my senator asks me my official opinion on Senate Bill 840? If your senator solicits that information from you, ask for that request in writing. And if you have that request in writing, you need to keep it. File it away in a safe place and if you are then allowed to testify, what would happen is the committee would go out of session to allow someone who's not a member of the House or Senate to testify. 
your testimony would become part of the public record. Um, it would be videotaped and then uh, as, as you are testifying, um, you, you are operating within the confines of what you are allowed to do because you have specifically been asked because you are a subject matter expert on that topic. Okay? What if my coalition asks my personal opinion on a bill? As a private citizen, you are allowed to have your personal opinion. However, you cannot lobby with federal funds. So, if you are acting in your role as Stephanie Strutner, Executive Director of ASAP of Anderson County, a 501c3 funded by federal funds, I cannot ever lobby. Now, if I am Stephanie Strutner, not being paid right now by federal funds, not on the clock at my job, not using my work email or my work uh, telephone or other method of correspondence. I am Stephanie Strutner, resident of Knoxville, Tennessee, and I am free to my own beliefs and opinions. And as a private citizen, I can share with anybody I want to however I feel about anything on the earth. But when I'm acting in the capacity of Stephanie Strutner, Executive Director of ASAP of Anderson County, I have to abide by a different set of rules. Is that clear? If Pat issues a statement to you with respect to something that's happening in our field, it's important that we do what we can to respond to that very quickly. So you might get an email from the Prevention Alliance of Tennessee that lets you know that there might be an important committee meeting coming up that week and that will be all that the email will say and so then it's up to us to use that information tracking bill activity is a full-time job and it's very difficult and so we kind of rely on each other to have a huge network of people who are watching different things so as we get word that uh, bills are progressing or moving through committees then we'll try to share that information with you as it becomes available to us. So if you are tracking bills, please do share that information with us and we'll share information uh, with the stakeholders as it um, is timely. So with that, um, what we ask as a committee is that you use that information and then perhaps share it with your coalition and allow them the opportunity to voice uh, their opinions on certain issues with their elected officials. And that's also a very timely opportunity to provide information to your elected officials on certain topics and make sure that it's fresh on their mind when they go into a committee to vote on uh, specific issues. Make sure that you um, engage your coalition membership in that. Your question about um, having coalition members who want to be a, more involved in advocacy or even lobbying is a great example because um, we are, our purpose is to empower the people in our community to stay, take a stand on what they believe in. And so that's just an extension of, of you doing that. Pick up the phone, call your elected officials, talk to them about the issues, pick up a pen, write them a note. Uh, just give them a, a couple short sentences about what's important to you. Um, this is your mission, should you choose to accept it. We are fortunate to live in a democracy, and it only works if we engage in that democracy. So our elected officials get paid to represent our views as their constituents. A lot of people take that for granted. How many times have you heard somebody say, what is my little phone call gonna do? I've heard it many, many times. And I know I have shared this ad nauseum, but Senator Alexander says that if he gets seven phone calls from his constituents on one side or the other of an issue, he considers that an overwhelming community response. He represents six and a half million people. <laughs> That's not that many phone calls. So I, an, another example is Walmart 
um, wanted to build a new store literally in my backyard. My husband and I built a house last year. We moved in in January and last month the Metropolitan Planning Commission in Knoxville held a meeting to discuss a proposal for a Walmart to go on top of what is now a soccer field and park that is my backyard. So guess what I did? I called my mama, I called my daddy, I called my two best friends. I'm like, listen, y'all, I need you to get on the phone right now, call the mayor. I don't want Walmart in my backyard. You want to hear me complaining about it all the time? Nope. All right, get on the phone. <laughs> and guess what? They all did, and I pestered the heck out of them until they picked up the phone and called the mayor, and I called them and said, hey, did you talk to the mayor? All right, what did he say? Okay, what did you say? Okay, thanks. Guess what? The developer withdrew their proposal. And now I'm not saying that was just because of me, but that day the mayor got over 380 phone calls about that one issue. So guess what his assistant was doing all day long? Picking up the phone. <laughs> I'd like to engage you in another discussion item. Um, so among people around you, how do you engage your members in advocacy? And I'll give you about three minutes to discuss this. How do you engage your members in advocacy? I think some of the best ways are effective communication, and I also think training. If, if your person, your, your coalition member does not know about the issues and the topics, how are they going to effectively uh, engage in that conversation with anyone? And I recently, uh, another thing I, I can advocate is encourage either them or, or to serve on a nonprofit board. Uh, that changed my perspective. I just recently rolled off from a year's service um, on how what my board goes through and, and the challenges and also the, the, the good stuff. So, that's Thank what I you. Have. Thank you for that. Well, just like Tanya said, um, excuse me, Tanya said, um, first things first is providing the training to your coalition members. A lot of people don't know the difference between advocacy and lobbying, so definitely educating them on that is important. Um, and giving them the facts, always making that present at your meetings so that they developed the understanding of you know what needs to happen or what change needs to be present so great thank you all for sharing I appreciate that I want to shift our discussion now to the General Assembly's website um, the capital.tn.gov website is a very interactive really cool website that allows us inside information on what's happening in Nashville it takes a little bit of time to get comfortable with how to use the website, but once you do, it's very easy, it's very user friendly. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many have already an account on the General Assembly's website? Okay. So the first thing, and, and the steps are in your packet, um, in the PowerPoint, uh, if you want to take these back and share this uh, PowerPoint with your staff, your coalition members. Um, please feel free to share this. Um, go to capital.tn.gov. There's a link where you can click on My Bills, and then you click Register Here, and you can set up your account. It requires an email address, and you have to identify a password. Then it allows you to log in, and you can search the bills. You can search them by keyword or by subject or by sponsor. So who is the legislator or legislators who are sponsors and co-sponsors? Um, you can also add those to lists. You can make different lists and follow the activity of bills within the list categories that you come up with. And so you can monitor those. So every time you go back to the website, if you're tracking multiple bills, you don't have to look them up every time. You just log into your account and they're all listed there for you. If you want to track bill activity, Click on My Bills, then you can click Add New List, 
and then track the bills by view and edit bills list. You can also sign up for an RSS feed which will send you an email anytime there's new activity on the bill which is really helpful um, especially if you've just checked a few days ago and the it's waiting on a date to be set on the calendar and then the calendar date is set then you'll get an RSS feed uh, via email that tells you that the calendar date has been set so you can go and look and see what that date is. I'd like to take a second to take you to the website right now and just show you. I think when we hear that it doesn't make any sense if we're not looking at it. So when you get to the General Assembly's website what you want to do is go up here, uh, if you see where my cursor is, at the top right of the screen, click on My Bills. This takes you to the My Bills main page. And you can either log into My Bills in this area with your current username or password, or if you're not already a registered user, which I would encourage everyone who is a member of PAT to be a registered user um, at the General Assembly's website. Um, click register here and when you click register here you'll fill out just some brief information that will allow you to uh, create an account. If you already have an account then you can log in and it will take you to your bills list and these are bills this is my account um, I just named my list prevention I have in the past had different categories for alcohol, tobacco, prescription drugs. Um, I think you can have three lists. I don't think you can go more than that right now, <clears throat> which has been a barrier for me because there are more than three categories that I want. So now I just have them lumped into one category. It shows the number of bills that I'm watching, and this is left over from last legislative session. Um, I can view or edit the bills. I can edit my list or I can delete my list um, which I will likely do uh, before January rolls around and the new session begins so I can start a new one. At any rate if I want to look at the bills that I have saved I click on view and edit bills and it shows the bill number as well as underneath the sponsor and the companion bill so if you're looking at this identifier here. This is House Bill 1157. It was sponsored by Representative Ramsey. The Senate Bill is 1266 and that was sponsored by Senator Yeager. So for bills to be considered there has to be a Senate sponsor and a House sponsor and so there are going to be um, really two different avenues that you have to follow for that one topic. It also gives you a little abstract in the middle of what the bill is about and then it shows you the last action. <clears throat> there are a lot of abbreviations used on this website because the full words are so long so we have some information that we'll share with you on how to interpret those. Um, and then the last action date, the last date that anything happened uh, with respect to that specific piece of legislation. If you want to know more, then you click on the bold letters and it goes to show you a more detailed timeline of the bill history. You can read any amendments. You can also watch video and I, I have watched the video feed many times. Um, I couldn't be present in Nashville every time I wanted to be there last legislative session and so I could go and click on the video link and there won't be anything well there, there might be some it's Friday there's probably not much going on on the hill today but if there were we could do a search and if you click on and and they're also archived which is really cool so if you miss something it, it's live but it's also archived so you can go back and click on a bill and watch the session as it relates uh, to discussion over that topic which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, you can read the bill summary and then also check to see if it has a fiscal note and to view the fiscal note then you would click on the view fiscal note link and it will give 
not only a summary of the bill, but also discuss the fiscal note. And of course, the fiscal note is how much money is it going to cost the state of Tennessee. And then finally, you can look at the votes. And this is important for us, um, especially as the Provincial Alliance of Tennessee becomes, um, is around for longer then we might have issues that kind of come up one year and then lay low for a few years and then come up a little while later. And if those people are still uh, seated in the state legislature, we might want to look back and see what they voted in years past um, to maybe influence the type of information that we are giving to them. Any questions about how to set up an account on the tn.gov, capital.tn.gov website? Important information that we want to know about bills, if we're interested in tracking those bills, are the bill number, or what, what are we going to call it, uh, the sponsor, the co-sponsors, the summary of the bill, what, what is it about, uh, the history. The history is important. Um, let's take medical marijuana as an example. Medical marijuana bills were introduced in the House and Senate last year. The House went uh, all the way to the committee before um, the final House vote um, and the only reason it failed, well it, it failed in committee but went to a summer study. In the Senate, the medical marijuana bill failed in the first committee. So that's important for us this year <clears throat> because I know, furthermore, I was at the Senate summer study meeting earlier this week and I'm pretty confident that right now the majority of people are opposing medical marijuana in the Senate. So I know I've got to go spend a little bit more time working in the House committees to make sure that I'm providing them the information that they need to make a decision that's going to be best for everyone in the state of Tennessee. The amendments, um, of course, as I mentioned, with respect to the state website are important so many times, and I, I didn't get this until last year, to be honest with you, the amendment makes the bill. And I've heard that term many times, but it never resonated with me because I just didn't understand. Because you think somebody writes a bill and submits it, well, that's what it's gonna be, not true. Because what happens is it's amended by committees and the amendment is what passes. It's not the original bill as it was written, but the amendment. And so that's why we can't take for granted um, the bill summary and assume that that's what it means. Because so many times we have to click on the amendment because the amendment, and it'll say, um, it'll have text in there that says this amendment rewrites the bill. <clears throat> Again, the fiscal note is really important. If a bill has an incredibly high fiscal note, sometimes if a bill has any fiscal note, it will not pass. So that's something that we really want to keep our eye on. And then also the votes. How, how are our representatives and senators voting on certain issues? Uh, it might be that I don't need to spin my wheels and use my time talking to Senator Briggs about medical marijuana because I know where he stands on it. He's a surgeon and has a, a very clear stance. There are a few other people on that committee that are undecided and so I might want to spend more of my time educating them about the ramifications that medical marijuana could have on Tennessee. Does that make sense? Helpful tools on the website are how a bill becomes a law. There's a link um, at the bottom of um, the website that says helpful tools and you can click on the helpful tools link and it, it gives you a list of um, these items. How a bill becomes a law, uh, a glossary of terms which is important. Um, when I started looking more deeply into the state legislature I had to look up what a committee meeting meant and what calendar meant. I mean I know what a calendar is but as it pertains to the TN capital.tn.gov website, I didn't know what calendar meant. Now I know that calendar means that 
a bill has been put on the calendar and a date has been scheduled when it will be heard next. And so there are some nuances that you might want to become familiar with. Uh, Tennessee Code Annotated is also available uh, through the website um, to a, an external link that provides a list of every law that exists in the state of Tennessee. Um, it is quite lengthy, but it is easily searchable if you've never used it before. Other helpful tools could be acts and resolutions and information about those and, and what they are and what they do. And then also the Tennessee Constitution is available on that website as well. And so each of these might be um, items that you might either want to share with your coalition or at least have at your disposal. Finally, I want to wrap us up by talking a little bit more about the TN Prevention Saves campaign and just to say that it's critically important to our efforts this year for our day on the hill. This campaign is what's going to be our unifying voice. If some of you might have been there with me last session when the higher education had their day on the hill and guys it was amazing. They had <clears throat> essentially a college fair set up in the hallways at Legislative Plaza. <coughs> Excuse me. They had um, each university and each college represented in the state of Tennessee and it they lined from from when you came in the door on the south side of the building to all the way to the escalators that go up to the north side of the next door building. The hallways were lined on both sides <laughs> table to table with college fair signs. That's what the Education Outreach Committee um, has our eyes set on for coalitions. And all those people were doing was providing information about their school. That's what we want to do is provide information about coalitions and about what our coalitions do in our community and how Tennessee benefits from that. And so if you haven't signed up yet, please do so today. Leah has the sign-up sheets. Um, we want to make sure if you are unable to be there, find a coalition member who can be there. And we want to make sure uh, that there's somebody from every existing coalition in Tennessee. Um, I would like for us to have at least 50 coalitions there from their house as well. So another idea. Well, I'm really excited about our Day on the Hill. Uh, the committee has been working on this for two years now. Um, it's been a long time coming, but it's very exciting. And I hope that each of you will be there. Anderson County will be there. We will have a bus. I'm told by Stacy this morning we have 19 students who will be coming with us on a school bus. Um, I hope that you will be able to bring some of your coalition members, perhaps some of your youth volunteers or other community stakeholders so that we have a really strong presence in Nashville this year. Thank you guys.